want to use my religious belief systems to influence policy, that's not allowed to me by secularity or secularism, but it is allowed by pluralism. So there's contradictions. What if something which is democratic contradicts something which is liberal? What do you do in that situation? So here, the truth is, there is nothing you can say at all to convince us in the same way as many colonial forefathers, not of himself, I'm just saying of the Western people in general, used to come to our countries and tell us to believe in what they believe. And just like in Algeria, we rejected this because they did not provide any proof for what they believe. And today, we're finding the same thing again. You're not providing any proof. So what I'm going to conclude with is a list of just three questions. The second one has subcompartments, which hopefully the professor will answer. Number one is straightforward. Give us proof of liberalism. What kind of demonstrative proof have you got? Logical. Give me a rational argument using mantek or logic. Give me a mathematical argument, a scientific one. You can't just produce, say, be liberal. It's like coming here and say, be communist. It's ridiculous. Give me some proof. Number two, give us evidence for the presuppositions of liberalism. You mentioned equality and freedom. How can you even prove that freedom exists as an atheist materialist? I'm not sure if you're a materialist or not. Let alone being a desirable thing. You have to prove this. Equality, that's against the theory of Darwinian evolution. We're not born equal. That's what, that's what is mentioned in the documents. Like the, the, the United, uh, for example, the United States Constitution. Or the, sorry, the Declaration of Independence. But how can you prove that we're all born equal? John Locke said that we're endowed that equality from God. As an atheist, how can you prove equality? Prove it. Prove to us that we're born equal. That freedom exists. That it's a desirable thing. And that individual rights should be prioritized over collective rights, which is the basis for most moral liberal systems. You have to prove this. And do you admit that liberalism is capable of producing legally binding death penalty outcomes for non-allegiance to the state, for example? And if so, how do you suppose liberalism solves a so-called problem that is created by Islam? Please answer those questions. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed Hijab, for your presentation. We will now have the rebuttal session, where Dr. Lash will have 10 minutes to give his uh, comments on what uh, Mohammed Hijab have spoken, and you will have your time on the timer in front of them. So without any further ado. Thank you. Um, I must say that I'm uh, <clears throat> surprised by uh, the mixing here of uh, norm and fact by Mr. Hijab. Because he assumes that we can prove normativity, norms, in the same way that we prove the existence of the sun or that we are here today. These are two completely different areas, two different spheres. We don't use the same sort of logic. We don't use the same sort of arguments when we are discussing norms and when we are discussing facts, reality, the descriptive part of reality. So here is a confusion, a confusion that he brings with him into his presentation of the liberalist tradition. I am not in that tradition. I find parts of it sympathetic, but he is, and it seems to me that he's reading every text as a Salafi, as something that is there, like the Quran, unchangeable for eternity. The whole point with the tradition in, polo in political philosophy is that it develops. Of course, we do think and say, liberals do think and say something different from what John Locke said. That is the whole point of a philosophical tradition, is that those who followed John Locke looked at what he wrote and saw, ah, he's mistaken. I can do better. We can improve. And those that followed him again says the same thing. So liberalism, now I'm speaking as a teacher, is different today than it was at John Locke's time. 
And to say that we have to go back to John Locke to understand liberalism is plainly nonsense. I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense because liberalists today say something else than what John Locke said and wrote. So, so here there is a confusion and actually a, a rather strange, if not to say naive, presentation of uh, the liberal tradition in political uh, philosophy. Of course, people within the liberal tradition are affected by the circumstances. John Locke was a Christian. Many liberals, political liberals today, are not religious. They say and mean different things. And how the tradition, how the contradictions within the traditions has been addressed and changed. Mr. Hijab is quite correct. In the liberal tradition, there has been racist, racist attitudes, there has been arguments for the death penalty, it has been practiced and, liber and legitimized, justified by liberals. Today, if we say that liberal political philosophy, liberal political thinking is predominant, and there is a case for that, in the Western world today, look at Europe today. They have all abolished the death penalty. So, to argue that John Locke was in favor of the death penalty 400 years ago uh, and relating that to liberalism today is simply absurd. Doesn't make any sense because liberalism today is completely different. And then what about? You cannot avoid it. Because if you are saying that Islam is Islam and it's perfect from the beginning and that is absolute, there is no relativity here. It's the same throughout the centuries because the basis is the same. The Quran is the same and the Sunnah is there. Yes. What about today? No, you cannot, you cannot justify racism in Islam. About the equal number of slaves transported to the Americas was captured and sold from Africa into the Muslim world over several centuries. Wasn't that racism? And if you think it disappeared well some time ago because today we preach a more enlightened form of Islam, you're wrong. Some of you with black skin, having been in the Middle East, would know that. Skin racism, skin color racism, racism is still prevalent in the Middle East. Don't tell me otherwise. I have spoken to blacks, black Muslims studying Islam in Syria, telling me how they have faced racism in that country amongst Muslims. And if you say that, well, the West, they have been do, committing atrocities, it is true. And who? Who are those who have addressed those atrocities, critiqued them, made interpretations of politics change? Well, they are the same people in the West criticizing France for its occupation of Algeria. Where are the Muslims protesting against Saudi Arabia? Muslims killing children, Muslim children in Yemen today. Where are they? Where are all the Muslims protesting against Saudi Arabia's killing of Khashoggi a year ago? Don't tell me that, oh, you are to blame for this and that colonialism. What about Islamic colonialism? What about Islamic imperialism? Oh, no, we just spread the word. We didn't use soldiers at all. We didn't conquer Spain, you know. We just persuaded the Spaniards to become Muslims. I am not the one who says that Islam was mainly spread by the sword, because that is not true. But it was also spread by the sword. Jihad fi sabil Allah. Don't tell me otherwise. So if you are saying that your interpretations of this and that political philosophy is different from, then you are comparing bad Western practices with Islamic ideals. You're not looking at Islamic practices and comparing them with Western ideals. And that is also a fallacy. Finally, there are many things that could be said here, but, uh, but finally, when it comes to the liberal tradition, again, 
Mr. Jab is asking for proofs, and he's saying that uh, liberalism is based on a fallacy, on something that cannot be proven. That, that's true. No one pretended that the state of nature could be proven, at least not today. It might have been a, a hypothesis that Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, thought was plausible also in the empirical sense, not least because of the colonial experience. But the fact is that when most of the liberal theoreticians talk about a state of nature. It is a hypothesis. It's a logical hypothesis they use to establish premises that you can use to argue in favor of certain moral ethical principles. We're not talking about facts. We are talking about norms. We are talking about the basis for a logical argument that can justify individual freedom, the state's need to withdraw from total domination of the individual, and so on. So uh, again, there is a confusion of the empirical and the normative in Mr. Hijab's presentation, which I find very, very strange. Finally, if there is such a thing that, well, we are influenced by this and that, and we have the colonial past and uh, colonialism is wrong. Why? Why is colonialism wrong? I would like to have Mr. Hijab answer that. Because if he says it's wrong because, and I agree with him, then we have something common. In spite his religious starting point and my non-religious starting point. And that is what is interesting me. So, to comment on the questions, and I cannot do but comment on them, I don't need to give proofs of liberalism. It doesn't make any sense. First of all, I'm not a liberalist in the philosophical sense. And second, it is a sort of system that cannot be given proofs. It can be shown to be consistent or inconsistent. And because of certain of its inconsistencies, I am not a political liberal. <clears throat> so. The, and I've just commented on the evidence of liberalism's presupposition, the state of nature, born equal, etc. Born equal, yes. Are you saying that we are not born equal? That is also a hypothesis. Of course, when, when Rousseau said that we were born equal, he did not necessarily mean that in a literal, empirical sense. But he said, when the baby comes out of the mother, they are equal. Some grow up slaves, some grow up as laborers, some will be princes and rulers. Of course he knew that. He wasn't a stupid man. But he made a premise that you have to argue why we are not equal. That is the important thing. So liberalism can produce various outcomes, as we have seen. But so will Islam, as we have seen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lash, for your rebuttal. Now we will have Mohammed Hijab giving his 10 minutes of comments. So I'm very happy with that, actually. A lot, a lot of that is exactly what I wanted to hear. He said, liberalism cannot be proven. And then he said, we're born equal. And he said to me, the burden is, uh, of proof is on me. But actually, no, the burden of proof is on the one who's making the claim. The burden of proof is not on me to prove why we're not equal, because that's demonstrative. When we're born out of the mother's womb, some of us are tall, tall, dark, and handsome like myself. <laughs> and some of us are... <laughs> yes. And some of us are not. And so, I'm not saying you, right? And so on, okay? No, what are we equal in? We're not equal in physical characteristics. We're not equal in opportunities. Some of us are born in different geographic locations. Some of us are born in, in the east, west, north, south, wherever it may be. What is equal about our opportunities or our physical characteristics? From a strictly scientific perspective, there's nothing equal about how we're born at all. No, the burden of proof is not on me. The burden of proof is definitely on you. Now, having said that, we do believe in an equal spiritual opportunity from an Islamic perspective. We can say that by arguing from first principles. The problem is, you can't argue from first principles as admitted by yourself because you need an 
a, a systemic vantage point which doesn't have the end as the beginning. This is how you argue in your debates. You start by saying human rights is a good thing, but you have no way of proving that according to your own admission. Your understanding of human rights, you cannot say I'm not a liberal now, because you've been promoting human rights all your life. That's what you've been doing. How can you not be a liberal and human rights is a birth child of liberalism, is a birth child of liberalism and you've been promoting it, harassing Muslims in debates, telling them you have to be this and you have to be that, and you cannot even prove human rights because you cannot even prove its seedbed, epistemic seedbed, which is liberalism. Don't run away from the question saying that liberalism in his definition is lack of strictness. Well, I can say, the Prophet said, don't be strict. But that's according to our understanding, our jurisprudential understanding of strictness. You have to have a... When you say strict, what do you mean? You're talking about enlight, post-enlightenment ideas. This is perfect. This is the trap mode. And then he tried to say, because right now he's running away from it. Sorry to say, I'm not trying to push you into a corner. But what I am saying is, he came today and tried to equivocate. It's called the fallacy of equivocation. Use the, the, the dictionary definition of the word liberalism when all his life he's been using the political philosophical definition of liberalism. And by the way, the dictionary definition is informed by the political definition to run away from proving what he has to prove. That's the reality of what's happened today. Then he says, talks about discrimination. Now he's confusing feminism with liberalism. He says, why are women in the back and men in the front? This is a second wave feministic interrogation. Why should we go for a second wave feministic interrogation, not a third wave feministic interrogation, which would ask you, by a third wave feminist would ask you, how do you know they're women? Have you asked for their pronouns? No, honestly. Honestly, how do you know? I mean, a queer studies theory would say that. So you're trying to force us. You don't even know what you're arguing for. That's the reality of the situation. You've come here with a gun with no bullets. And you've shot it at the wrong man. Because the reality is now you're being questioned on your own ideology. He says, John Locke, liberalism has changed since John Locke. If you listen to what I said, I said, I don't care what John Locke said. I said, it's the principles of liberalism. I use John Locke as a supporting argument, not as a main argument saying that everything that John Locke says is liberalism. I said that contractarian forms of liberalism, or otherwise we're referred to as contractual forms, which are the only forms you'll see in the whole wide world. Give me one Robert Nozick style utopian anarchy in his book, I'm sure you've read it. Non-contractarian form of uh, liberalism on the earth today, you won't find it. Therefore, what's happened today is, it's as if I was debating someone about Christianity and Trinity and say, look, actually I don't really believe in Christianity, I only believe in parts of it. So I, of course you're going to run away from the question because you have to prove yourself at this point. And when neoliberal, yes, orientalist commentators are questioned on their principles, they retreat. They run away from answering. And if they do answer, they'll be honest, like he has been to be fair. He says, I, I can't prove this. And at the end, he tried to kind of run away from it and say, actually, you have to prove that we're not born equal. But actually, no, you have to prove that we are equal. Because that's a metaphysical equality. It's a metaphysical equality. It's not a physical one. You can't argue that we're physically e equal. We're definitely not. So if it's a metaphysical claim, it requires metaphysical proofs. You have to provide that. He says, well, there's a racism in the Middle East. I agree with you. But there's racism against black people and racism against Filipinos and racism against, you know, even Arabs are racist against themselves. And racism is a problem. And I agree with all of what you said there. I don't have any agree a disagreement with you on these points. But that's a straw man. I didn't say anything about it. I'm not here to defend the Middle East. If I was here defending the Middle East, I'm, I promise you he'd win the debate. I'm here to defend Islam. Qal Allah wa Rasul. Allah and the Messenger. I don't care what the Muslims do. Muslims are only uh, are applicable to the discussion if they form part of the ijma. Ah, for example, in a jurisprudential sense. He says... Islamic colonialism. Well, look, even if there was Islamic colonialism, I was made very clear. I can't hear, uh, stand here and defend 1,400 years of Islamic history. Very clearly, if there was Islamic colonialism with the connotations that it implies, and you are asking me to condemn it, which is uh, misappropriation of land, taking people out of their homes, and so, that's wrong. We don't believe in that, but we do believe in an age of empire where there was a medieval realist form in an international relations perspective of power relations, if you know your neighbor is about to take you over and you have two choices as a government, 
then it's not morally objectionable from my perspective to offer them the ultimatum first. It's not a UN style uh, situation where we can uh, agree. And Islam says, Islam says if there are peace treaties in place to stop that from happening and we're sure that our neighbors will not do that, then those peace treaties must be respected. So if, the, if my neighbor, if I was living in the medieval period and my neighbor, my geographic neighbor said, I'm not going to you know, come into you, try and overtake you, you don't overtake us, and there was an agreement, I would say, it's haram, wrong, morally unacceptable for them to invade. But unless the neighbor can provide such guarantees, then I would say it becomes uh, possible and an option in that, in, that, uh, in that context. Because you either get eat, you either eat or you're going to get eaten. As you would say in a, in, a biograph, in a biological sense, Darwinian sense. So really, these are the points. And he said that men and women, let's take, let's take the gender... Uh, the dichotomous second wave feminist uh, thing. How is that discrimination against women? I swear men and women get exactly the same. Like, if men can't go into women's area, women can't go into men's area, isn't that the same? Isn't that the rights of men and women are exactly the same in that situation? How can you say that that's discrimination against women? It doesn't make any sense because if the same rules apply to men to women, then that's, that's actually a form of equality. Now the question is, why do you allow certain separations in certain contexts? I'm from UK. We have girls' schools. Boys' schools, that's an educational setting. This is an educational setting. I've never seen you condemn that. Why don't you condemn that? Why don't you condemn certain separated... Uh, why? Because the white man said so. That's the reality. When the white liberal man decides this is an acceptable form of separation which has no problem with our sensibilities, then we have to uh, uh, hear... We have to hear and obey the colonial overlord. No! That's weak. Give us some proof. You've just come here and said, well, John Locke, liberalism has changed, therefore run away. No, you come here to a debate that is entitled, does Islam need to be liberalized? You need to show us first why liberalism is true and desirable before you can convince us of that. I know that Muslims have a bad track record, but what I'll say to you is this. As Muslims, what are we calling you to? In the last minute, I'll say this. We're calling you to forget about the hedonistic principle where the procurement of pleasure is the main thing. We're saying constrict your pleasures. In the same way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has constricted the laws of the heavens and the earth, has constricted the laws of nature, we're saying as Muslims, we would rather constrict ourselves and our behavior, constrain our behaviors in line with the divine divine guidance. Allah says in the Quran, which is actually a response to liberalism, I believe. By the other blemish, he says, وَلَوْ اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ وَهُوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنْ بَلْ لَتَيْنَاهُمْ بِذِكْرِهِمْ فَهُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِهِمْ مُعْرِضُونَ If the heavens and the earth had followed their desires, everything in the heavens and the earth would have been destroyed. We have come with the reminder. The reminder is to follow Allah's laws instead of following your own whims and desires, which is the essence of liberalism. The hedonistic principle. And then you'll find meaning in life. We should change the title today after this discussion to Should Liberalism Be Islamicized? Jazakum Allah Khairan.